I was doing a lot of bands that really had no idea what mastering was. I honestly didn't know the full extent of what mastering was at the time. But um, the studio guy, he had a suite of software. He had, um, it was made by Sony at the time. Actually, it was made by Sonic Foundry in Madison, Wisconsin. Sony bought it. But it was like a suite of programs called, one was Vegas Video, ironically, but we did the audio in there. It was like a multi-track audio program. Yeah, I, I, I remember Vegas, yeah. I, I, and, you know, com- I worked with a video editor once who used it, yeah. <laughs> it, it was fine. I mean, computers back then w- weren't really up to the task of mixing in the box. So we were really using it as a tape machine with some editing capabilities. Now, we weren't loading it up with plugins and trying to do a whole mix. We were still mixing on a console. Stuff like that. So it almost didn't matter what program you used because it was just the tape machine. Um, but anyways, he had um, Vegas Video, SoundForge for like edits, and then he had it had CD Architect. I don't know if you remember CD Architect. Um, super no. basic mastering <laughs> program. I mean, you, you load in the songs, you can arrange them, do crossfades, you can put pl- you know a super rudimentary mastering program. So I felt. You know, there are definitely some records I regret mastering back in the day that I also recorded and mixed um, because I'm sure I didn't do a great job. But I did master a lot of the stuff we recorded, for better or worse, um, if there was no budget. And, you know, there was no mastering studio in the area. It was kind of a big complication to, um, you know, send a record off for mastering at that point in time because you're you're mailing DVDs or or – Something like that, you know, it was, it was a bigger operation than a lot of the bands were up for, um, for dealing with. In fact, I remember yeah. that band I was in on Lookout Records, they said, well, we have this guy, John Golden, master all the records. And we're like, okay, that's fine. You know, we sent him the mixes. He sent it back. We didn't even, it didn't even cross our mind that we could ask for like changes at that point. It was just like, he mastered it. So now it's done. It wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't like now where it's like, can you turn it up half a dB and then add point three of 10 K on the verse of song three, you know, it was like none of that. It was just like, send it off, get it back. It's done. Um, There's probably something freeing about being done with it like that, you know? Yeah. And I don't know if I ever even really listened to it, but that was kind of the sense of mastering back then, at least in my area. It's like, no one really knew what it was. So I was doing it for bands. So I kind of got a feel for it anyways, for better or worse. And then I moved to Madison, Wisconsin to work at Smart Studios, just kind of continuing doing the same thing that I was doing in Green Bay, but in a nicer studio. I don't say nicer, but a more well-known studio. Um, So I was getting a slightly higher caliber of bands and clientele in there. And so still doing mostly recording and mixing, but also mastering when I had to. But at some point, I just started getting calls to just do mastering. They, They would say, hey, I saw that you mastered this album. And I'd be like, well, I didn't really master it. I just... No one else. I was the last person that <laughs> touched it. So I guess that makes yeah. me the mastering person. So I slowly, you know, on the back burner was honing my mastering skills. Although looking back, I, I'd be afraid to listen to some of it. But I could see the writing on the wall for Smart Studios Future. Bands were really just coming in to do the drums and then they would take it home and finish it. And if they had any budget left, they might come back and mix it. But Smart wasn't getting, like, the big sessions that they used to. You know, there would be occasional ones, like Death Cab for Cutie mixed a record there, which turned into, like, it was like a three-month ordeal, which turned into, like, I remember their drummer flew in to, like, redo some drums because they weren't up to par. Like, something was going on. Well, which, which record was this? Uh, Plans. Oh, yeah, it's a great record. Yeah, so Plans, I was there when, I didn't work on it, but I remember being there when they were mixing it, I was working, I had to work upstairs for like three months in the Studio B because they took over Studio A. It was mostly Mm -hmm. Chris Walla and Bo Sorensen. But yeah, there was like a a few days where the drummer flew in to like re-record some drums at Smart because it wasn't, something was, I don't know if they weren't happy with what they had originally recorded or just got better ideas or what happened, but it was meant to be mixing, but it was like three months of mixing and some overdubs. Anyway, aside from a few projects like that, you know, Smart, I could just tell it wasn't getting the projects to sustain itself long term. You know, it was a big building in an expensive city close to downtown. They had a bit of a staff, which was cool for me. You know, I came from the studio in Green Bay where, like, it was me and the owner. We did everything um, from cleaning the toilets to tuning the vocals. And this yeah. this place had a staff, uh, you know, they had a technician that fixed broken stuff. They had a guy that mostly was just the studio manager, making sure the sessions were booked and and everyone was happy, and then a couple engineers. But I could just see that 
it was going to close soon, basically, is what my feeling. So I ended up moving to Milwaukee, which is like an hour, a little over an hour away, just because I had spent so much time in Milwaukee. I knew a lot of the bands and the music scene, and it was just a little bit more my style. You know, Madison's a very, it's a college town and a political town. And while I am more into politics than I used to be, it just really didn't resonate with me in my early 20s, um, being around politics and a fancy college, you know, just like couldn't really relate to Madison as much um, at that time. Mm-hmm. Milwaukee's like a rock and roll, beer drinking, party, yeah, t- party town. My association with Milwaukee is is like, um, oh, shoot, what's the name of the movie? I'm totally blanking. Wayne's, Wayne's World. World. Yeah, Wayne's World. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they come up to Milwaukee for Alice Cooper concert. I mean, it's... it's a, That's right. Milwaukee. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. No, it's a great city. So I knew what I was getting into. So I moved to Milwaukee and just started freelancing at a couple studios in town to, to get my feet wet. Because I had clients and I had work to do. I just didn't have a space. And not too long after that, like probably the mastering guy in Wisconsin, his name is Trevor Sadler. Um, he was like the guy that you would send records to if, if there was a budget for mastering. Um and he decided that he was going to move like to Charlotte, I think it was, Charlotte, North Carolina, so pretty far away. And um, when he moved, you know, we I used to send records to him to master when there was a budget. And when he decided to move, he was like, hey, do you want to rent my studio when I move because I'm moving? And uh, for me, it was kind of a no-brainer because I was already like getting more and more serious about mastering. And here, this beautiful mastering room, not the one I'm in now, but a different room fell into my lap. You know, it was already built out. I had to furnish it. You know, I, he didn't leave any equipment, but um, that's what really made me pivot into mastering, like, seriously. I'm like, okay, you know, I need to get a Crane Song Avocet so I can hear what I'm doing because that's what all the mastering studios have. Um, and just built out my monitoring system and built it up from there. But, you know, that's when I had to get really serious about mastering and really dive in and figure out what it really was so that when I got calls for mastering, I wouldn't be like guessing or saying, sure, I know how to do that. And then I have to go figure out how to do that. I mean, there's plenty of moments like that in my life where you just got to figure it out on the, on the fly. But that's what really pushed me into mastering is moving to Milwaukee. The room fell into my lap. I had enough clients to start, you know, doing mastering seriously. I was still recording and mixing though. So I had, it was a slow change. It wasn't like one day I just was mastering all of a sudden it was yeah, yeah, it was yeah. gradual. Right. I, I feel like a lot of people think these tr- transitions are are instantaneous, but yeah, usually yeah. there's a a long <laughs> a long transition oh, yeah, with all it, kinds of. It was so slow. I mean, it was already happening before I got my first studio space in 2009 when I like had to register officially with the government. But even for a few years after that, I was still recording and mixing like some of the my favorite clients. You know, if it was like a really big record, I didn't want to say no. Or if it was a client I've worked with for years and really just knew they'd be easy to work with, I was still recording and mixing those. I brought on a couple assistants to help with the recording and mixing, mostly the recording. So I was really just mixing and mastering and kind of overseeing some records that, you know, I just knew that I, I didn't have the time to like fully invest myself in. But I had a couple of people I trusted to get it recorded well. I could edit and mix it and then go from there. But yeah, that was like probably a close to a five year, four or five year like transition. I mean, towards the end there, it was pretty rare when I would mix a record, but it still happened. Uh, but yeah, yeah, super slow. And, you know, at one point I just, I was getting myself into trouble saying, yeah, I can mix that record. But then what would happen, you know, f- you know how it is like mixing, it, it, you need a, like a window of time to mix a song. I feel like it's not something you can do sure. in 30 minute spurts. So, you know, I, I would block, I'd be like, okay, Thursday, I'm going to like start mixing this record I agreed to mix. But then like the day before, someone would be like, oh, we have the, can you master this album like tomorrow? Cause we already have the CD release show booked and, you know, we got to get the, get it in production. So can you master this like tomorrow? And I could, so I, and I would, but then the mixing projects that I did agree to just kept getting pushed back and back. And a couple yeah. people got a little angry and... Yeah, it got a little, it got to the point where it was starting to be a problem. So I just said, you know, this is, so at that point I did make a pretty hard transition, but I was already like on the home stretch, you know, I was like past third base, sliding into home plate and I said, okay, I'm just, even if it's a great record, I'm not going to mix it because I, I don't have time. Like I'm just going to. Yeah. Mastering's your thing now. Yeah. I'm just going to make the client mad because it's going to take three months to get to it. And then I'm not going to be fully invested and be better off 
referring this to like a mix engineer that I know could totally nail it within a couple of weeks and then I can still master that record and still work on it. But I just had to make that decision at some point. So, so would you say that the market kind of told you mastering is your thing or was it also like, you know, you fell in love with the art of mastering itself? Or maybe a bit of both. Yeah, well, I think first, yeah, first the market said, you know, there's people that want you to do this. As I learned more about mastering, you know, I, I bought Bob Katz's excellent book. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's somewhere behind me. Yeah. I, I, I even have it. I remember, and I'm not a mastering engineer. I remember yeah. the day I bought it at Barnes & Noble because I'm like, okay, I'm really doing this. I should probably read this book because, you know, it's. I've heard it's good. Um, <laughs> and the guy that I um, took over the studio, he had a I think it got taken out, but I think it was in the first edition. He had a little, you know, all those quotes on the side of Bob's book. There's little quotes, and he, his name. He got a quote in the first edition of the second one, and I'm like, oh, I should buy this anyway. But that's when I got kind of serious about that, and I also, yeah, then I kind of fell in love with the process, and it's always fascinated me, like that part of the process. But you know, I, I didn't. I guess I didn't know what I didn't know. There was a time when I didn't know what I didn't know, and I'm like, I got to just figure out some of the details about some of these tools that get used in mastering and why and, and you know, a lot of quality control stuff I kind of knew but didn't really fully understand best practices. And yeah, I fell in love with the process. I also really enjoyed, as I was getting older, the uh, make your own hours. You're, you're not locked in a room with a band for 16 hours. That started to get hard for me as even before I was serious about mastering, just as I started to be doing more and better business, it was hard for me to you know, be locked in a room for 12 hours with a band and then still trying to keep up on emails and scheduling the next project. And you know, I didn't have a manager or an assistant to like be doing that. And as the world became more instant and social media driven, you know, you get done with a 12 hour session and your email inbox is blown up and your social media messages are giving you a seizure and you just don't even know how to recover from that. And that got hard for me. (laughs) That got really hard for me to be like, uh, yeah, balance that. I never got good at it. And then mastering is like, Oh, you mean I can master a song and then take an ear break and do some emails and then do the next song and then take, you Mm. know, I I really loved the independence of it. Um, Yeah. I resonate with that. I, when I do recording sessions, I'm like out of it. And then I get so stressed out because I've got like, 80 messages I got to follow up with and like everyone's demanding your attention all the time now. Yeah. And it's probably so. worse now. I mean, this was like, you know, early, this is like, I'm probably generally speaking about like 2012, 10. So things are a little slower. People aren't expecting you to write back in like four seconds back then. Um, you know, social media was still kind of new, but it was, I could just feel it. I'm like, this is tough. And, you know, I'm the kind of person where like I, when I'm doing something, I like to get really into it. You know, I like to have no distractions, and then it was just getting really hard to yeah. balance it all. So, I think that was the tipping point: is you know, ha- having more sensible hours and not doing like, you know, the thing with recording bands is like, for the most part, it's their like vacation, so they're ready to go like sixteen hour days, and you got like anywhere from three to five or six band members that all have ideas and they want to do them, and that's great, but it's really taxing on the engineer that does it every day because. They don't get a break. They don't get many breaks within the day. And then at that, maybe, maybe I should have been smarter, but I wasn't really, but I didn't like ever take like a week off between projects. It was always like the next, here's the next one, here's the next one. And I probably could have done that better or like been more, um, been more like uh, intentional, intentional about taking breaks and things. I just was, there was always too much to do. And then I felt like I was just getting like the, I I basically, I think I somewhat priced myself out of it because I would agree to do a record for a certain rates. I'm a big fan of day rates. I'm not a fan of hourly rates or mm-hmm. or, pro, or like, you know, project rates, that kind of thing. You know, and even if it was like a band that you knew it wasn't like the greatest record ever and maybe only the friends were going to hear it, I couldn't really just kind of half-ass it and leave that vocal part untuned or that that drum fill a little bit off. I I was such, I was getting too perfectionist about it and spending way more time than the budget allowed for. Cause I I knew my name was like where I'm at right now in my career. Oh (laughs) yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough, man. Like I just, I just couldn't let it go. I got too a little bit OCD about it, which is kind of, 
a good 